morning. We have a special treat this morning. We have Jim Holden uh, going to be speaking uh. to us about the magic and the romance of an African safari. Jim was born in Zambia and he attended school in Zimbabwe and in South Africa. He worked in the travel industry in Kenya and he enjoys stepping back into Africa several times a year. Please welcome Jim Holden. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Damo. How, how many of you have been to Africa? Several, I think. Oh, gosh, lots of hands. OK. Uh, just a quick aside to answer uh, uh, Brooke's question. Uh, so in Africa, a lot of people think it's backward, especially when it comes to communication. But we can take a cue from the elephants. And more and more studies are being done of elephants and how they interact. And surprise, surprise, elephants can actually communicate over miles and miles and miles. So in fact, they can communicate with another family of elephants that you cannot see. And they do it through, rather like whales, I gather. Uh, we can't actually register it. So communication in Africa is excellent, <laughs> if you're part of the elephant family. So I'm very glad to be here. And uh, all of you, by the way, Starting at um, 6.30, was it? 6.30, you all had to be here. Uh, would do very well on safari. <laughs> because, again, we take our cue from the wildlife on safari in that we start early, as the animals do. They get up, go to find water and food, etc. Uh, and then we siesta through the day until the afternoon when we then go about preparing ourselves for bed. So you all would do great on safari getting up uh, very early. <laughs> But the other thing, I'm very glad to be here and to be able to uh, share some insights with you into the magic and romance of safari. And I was very fortunate last night uh, being entertained to dinner by Diana and Ted uh, and learned a little bit more about your organization. And I was intrigued to learn it is all about enrichment. And I went through some of your past speakers. And it was quite an eclectic group. Uh, <laughs> People talking about uh, uplifting and uh, making yourself a better person, uh, being better able to understand others, etc., which is obviously a very good thing in this time and day. And then, lo and behold, I saw jumping out at me someone had actually talked about a similar subject to me. And it's young John over here. Talked to you not long ago about... <coughs> you see, in Africa, I can use that term because in Africa, I turned a magical age recently. And in our culture here, people want to reduce your years as a compliment. And so they'll say, my goodness, Jim, you don't look a day over 50. <laughs> but in Africa, it works the other way. In Africa, they revere age. And so in Africa, they'll say to me, my goodness, one of a one of a you don't look you don't look younger than about 80. <laughs> so I can, af I can refer to young John over there, who talked about Botswana. So you have had somebody talk to you about Africa. But there's a great connection between basically the themes of the topics that you've had people come and talk to you about and Africa. We can learn an awful lot about Africa. And you'll see as I go through the presentation, that one of the reasons that you can learn so much about Africa is that you're actually being taken home. I don't know if you all realize that, but stop and dwell for a minute that no matter what color we are, pink, green, like Kermit the Frog, <laughs> white or black, we all originated from Africa. And we originated in many parts. Southern Africa, right the way through to the north of Africa. And you'll see I had a slide here showing you the migrations and how we all, where we all originated from. And so, with that in mind, when you go back to Africa, you're taken back to your roots and you really reconnect. So, let's start. And the first question to ask is, okay, so what is safari? And is it this? No. <laughs> Anybody recognize this? I've got it on my phone. Uh, it takes me on a kind of safari, I suppose. It connects me to the internet. But that is not what we're talking about. 
Is it this? Yeah. Anybody seen this? No. This is an organization that will uh, teach you about all sorts of things, comprehensive technology, etc., and they produce books. Is it that? No, no. no it's not that. <laughs> so, next slide, please. So, um, is it this? Well, if you could read the Arabic, yes, it is, but we've rather corrupted the word. So the word safari that we're talking about today is actually an Arabic word, and it was safa, S-A-F-A-R. If you could read the Arabic, that's what it is. And safar is the Arabic word for journey. And so it's been uh, captured, if you like, by those Kenyans, the home of safari. So what we're actually talking about are the highlighted areas of Africa. So when we talk about safari, we're talking about what we call East Africa, and several of you have been there. These countries here, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, they're really the home of safari. And then all of what we call Southern Africa, starting with my little country, Zambia, here, yeah, that's where I'm from originally. Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, Mozambique. Not to forget the Indian Ocean Islands as well. So that's what we're talking about. So when it originally started, <coughs> safari was always synonymous with big game hunting. Anybody know this chap? This is Frederick Courtney Salou, famous white hunter, shot umpteen elephants uh, for the ivory. Um, and you'll see later on a slide, took Teddy Roosevelt on his safari in 1908. Uh, when he was sent by the Smithsonian Institute. But no, we're talking nowadays about photographic safaris, where you're in a jeep and you're, you're looking at the wildlife as much as they're looking at you, but you're pointing at them with a camera. So who am I? This is me, believe it or not, as a young version, John, uh, <laughs> growing up in Africa. So we were footloose and fancy free. We had the whole of Africa to ourselves in those days. And we lived, you might say, fairly primitively. This was the house that uh, I grew up in. We all had to build our own houses. And you can see the uh, round conical, sh uh, uh, round shape with the uh, thatched roof, which of course is how many of the local uh, houses are built. This is my illustrious grandfather who's responsible for all of us being out there. I'm now third generation. My children are fourth generation. So he was sent by a fellow um, who is infamous. A uh, lot of controversy, especially these days in Africa. But a fellow called Cecil Rhodes. Anybody heard of him? Oh, yeah. Cecil John Rhodes. So we all think we're very clever these days about outsourcing. And actually the British were doing it all those years ago. And they found a very clever way of expanding the empire without actually going to the tax ban, the tax, uh, without going to the public to raise taxes. And so what they did, they would find people like Cecil Rhodes, wealthy individuals, and say, OK, we'll give you a concession for this part of Africa. Put the Union Jack in there, put the flag in, and claim it on behalf of Britain. And you can then exploit the minerals and whatever other resources might be there. So that was Cecil Rhodes. And he then roped in my grandfather because he needed people to do his bidding. And he sent him off to what is today Zambia, the western side, to actually put the flagpole in and claim it on behalf of Rhodesia. Bad man, good man. Colonial. Dreadful. What do you think one of the first things he did was when he got there? He? He? Bought a dog? <laughs> Shot an elephant? Slave trade. Anybody know when the slave trade ended? William Wilberforce in the mid-1800s. He got there in 1904, alive and well, slave trade. So on the, north, on the western side of Zambia, the Arab slavers were in cahoots with the Portuguese. They would come across the Zambezi, raid the villages in, Z in Zambia, yoke them all up. You've probably seen those dreadful photographs of the villages yoked up by their necks, one to the other, in chains, march to the uh, coastline of the Atlantic Ocean, put in ships, 
shipped off to the islands of Principe and Sao Tome, which is in the uh, bay there. So they were bringing uh, slaves from Ghana and Nigeria, etc., collecting them up into uh, the islands of Principe and Sao Tome and then shipping them off to the New World to work in the sugar plantations, etc. So my grandfather was confronted with that, how to stop the slaving. And one of the things he did, and it's not a story for today, it takes too long, if you look at a map of Zambia, you'll see that it doesn't follow the line of the Zambezi River. Uh, most, most country borders do, and it did until he had to put a stop to the slave trade when they had a treaty, they had a, a conference with the uh, Portuguese, moderated by the King of Italy at the time, and they succeeded in moving the boundary 100 miles into what is today Angola. What did that do? It gave my grandfather that precious extra time to catch up with the slavers and then free the slaves that they'd captured and release them. Good man, bad man. Good man. Good man. And so that's me. Um, Africa's full of things that bite. This one you particularly don't want to be bitten by. Black mamba. Black mamba, absolutely. One of the few snakes, it's a very, very uh, poisonous snake, and the only snake that's able to stand on its tail oh my God. and actually rear up. And my brother and I once were walking on the farm and decided in our stupidity to take a shortcut through the long grass, which in those days took me up to about here. And as we were walking along, a snake appeared right in front of us. Oh my gosh. Stared us in the eye, and thankfully, he got as big a fright as we did. <laughs> and he went down and shoof off. And so we're here today to tell the story. But, I was just telling somebody else, I think I was telling you, John. We like to say this, and there's actually a famous quote, everything in Africa, no matter what they tell you, bites. <laughs> But the worst bite you'll ever get is the African bug. And you'll be going back again and again and again if you're bitten by the African bug. Oh. And hopefully today that's what we'll do. So, press down. No, no, you've, uh, you've got, hold on. Voila. So this is modern day me. On the Zambezi, and uh, anybody, anybody identify the fish? It's a tiger fish. So the other thing about Africa, it's full of exotic creatures, uh, not only on the land, but in the rivers and in the sea as well. And of course, many, many eccentric and interesting people. So... The next part of my presentation is to tell you about some of those eccentric folks and about the early romance of safari. So when, when I was growing up, my father, I told you, um, my grandfather's son, uh, was in the colonial administration. And that meant being responsible for a huge area of land in Africa in all respects. He was the judge. He was the tax collector, uh, he was the listener to people's problems, etc. And all of this was done through the local chiefs. And so we would go on what we called in Zambia, Ulendo, which is the Zambian word for safari. And this is how we went. So everything would be packed up. We had to carry everything because we were walking on game trails, game paths. No vehicles, no roads. Everything had to be carried. Uh, all the tent, all the cooking equipment, all the cooking utensils. And we traveled in style, very important for the British, to maintain standards amongst the natives in Africa so that they could see what we, they could all aspire to. So dinner was a lavish affair, and I just want to read to you very briefly from an article recently that Sonia found by the way, have I introduced Sonia to you all? No. Do you want to pop up, pop up, Sonia? <laughs> so Sonia and I worked together at Holden Safaris. And Sonia, a lot of you recognize because Sonia has actually been uh, part of your organization for many, many years. 
And then she saw the light and went to Africa with the Peace Corps uh, to, to a little uh, mountain kingdom in Africa called Lesotho. And now she's returned and uh, working with us at Holders Forest. Yes. And helping me with the presentation by rotating these slides. Thank you. But she found this wonderful article uh, when we were in uh, Kenya recently, and I just thought I'd read this. And it's because it captures uh, very well uh, what safari was all about. And it says that uh, in the early days, this was to do with professional hunters and the administrators, like my father. Um, and going on safari was a very, very complicated undertaking. A safari might take six months to organize. Think about it. Because during this time, enormous piles of kit would be steadily accumulated. And this is an article, obviously, about Kenya, and it's in Nairobi. Outside Nairobi's famous Norfolk Hotel, my grandfather, before he went to Zambia, was sent by another very famous individual called Sir George Pauling. Somebody mentioned railroads, that he might have been responsible for railroads. Sir George Pauling is the millionaire British businessman responsible for a lot of the railways in Africa. And so George Pauling sent my grandfather to Kenya to prospect and look for diamonds. Well, everybody knows there are no diamonds in Kenya, but he had a wonderful time, spent a year there on safari, traveling much like this. And in those days, the Norfolk Hotel was there, and it was the central point for setting off on safari. And so enormous piles of kit would be gathered in front of the famous Norfolk Hotel. And safaris lasted for around four months. And the contents would pile up silver candelabra, it's very important, crystal glasses, lace tablecloths, not any old plastic thing would do, and starched napkins. And not mentioned here, father would dress, dinner jacket, bow tie for dinner. Dinner would be laid, and then everybody was called to dinner. And us children had to be bathed, put on your proper best clothing, and go to dinner. Very important. In the middle of the bush, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Added to the kit were tents, medicine chests. Very important. We had to look after ourselves if we fell ill. Folding baths. Very important to be bathing. Not in the river. Folding bath. Salt for preserving, in the case of hunters, skins and ammunition for the guns. Everybody took guns, even if you weren't hunting, for protection. And one of the things you took a gun for, and if, you, if any of you get the chance to read Teddy Roosevelt's famous book, Game Trails, it's out of print, unfortunately, but you can get it on Kindle. It's a big, thick book. You'll see he talks about the challenge, one of the biggest challenges when you're on safari, you had about 200 of these people, porters. You had to feed them. And that meant shooting for the pot. And nowadays, we get very upset when we go on safari and we don't see anything. Where's all the game gone? Well, if you read Teddy Roosevelt's book and a lot of the early hunters, they would go for days without seeing anything. And mild panic would begin to settle in. Because if you weren't feeding your porters, They'd mutiny. They'd drop their loads, to heck with this, and go. And you couldn't whistle up Uber to come and collect it all and move it on. And once they got everything together, the safari would go out and it would be a momentous occasion. People would come, congregate, say goodbyes, all the porters and their families, goodbye, goodbye, you're going to go for four months. And as they left, They'd be cheering and shouting, and of course, quite amusing, they would take a clown with them, often a clown, to entertain the porters. And the clown, as it says here, would often, he'd run up and down the line of porters, bizarrely costumed, often with a pair of horns lashed to his head, pulling faces, telling jokes, and best of all, mimicking his employers. <laughs> and so I can remember as a child growing up, my grandfather or my father getting upset with one of the staff. You, why the hell are you doing that, you stupid man? Do that. And then a little while later, I'd come around the corner. Grandfather had gone off in a huff. And there they all were, 
with the man taking off my grandfather. And you are stupid, you are stupid. And they all laugh. And of course, they overact. <laughs> Very funny. Africans have a wonderful sense of humor. And so it goes on, and this is a wonderful introduction to safari. But I'm going to show you how safari has changed. Here's an original safari vehicle, when they did eventually get to vehicles. Notice how it's open. It's open vehicle, and we'll come to that in a minute. Here's the famous Teddy Roosevelt and his son Kermit. And they went, as I told you, in 1908. And anybody know what he was doing there? He just finished his first pres presidency before he started his second. Anyone know what he was doing in Africa? He was hunting. He was hunting. He spent 18 months there. What do you think he did in 18 months? It's a hell of a long time to spend in Africa. Well, he was there on behalf of the Smithsonian Institute. And his mission was to bring back specimens of every species that he could find. And for every species, he had to shoot an adult male, an adult female, a juvenile male, a juvenile female of every species. We're talking about rhinos, elephants, lions, buffaloes, on and on. Took him 18 months with his son Kermit. They're all shipped back to the Smithsonian Institute, and if you go to the Smithsonian, you'll see his lines there as he walks through the door. So he shot well over a thousand animals. That's what he was doing. Good man, bad man. It was educational. It was educational. Subject for debate at your next meeting. <laughs> Other illustrious people who found their way out there. Anybody know who this is? My namesake. So William Holden went out and found the Mount Kenya Safari Club, which looks like this today. It didn't in his day. It's in the lee of Mount Kenya itself. And he set this up. He fell in love with Africa, so many people do, for all his buddies to come out from Hollywood and enjoy themselves. And this, of course, is from that famous movie. Who, how many of you have seen it? Out of Africa. And this, of course, is Meryl Streep taking off Kara and Blixen. Mm -hmm. Sonia Hare's one of her countrymen from Denmark. Born in Denmark. Born in Denmark. In Denmark. And they talk funny. Um, but she, you can still visit her house yeah. in uh, just outside Nairobi in a suburb called uh, Karen, after her, Karen. That's her faithful factotum, Juma. And she's quoted as saying, if I could do one more thing before I died, this is when she'd got back to Denmark, she was, her coffee farm had been destroyed, she was now back in Europe and Denmark. If, uh, if I could do one more thing before I died, it would be to go on safari. That was her abiding wish. And that's how they went about. Uh, that's how when they went camping, that's how they would go. Today it's more lavish. People have built <laughs> things like this. And Africa, by the way, is full of very colorful, eccentric people who've gone out to Africa and done the sort of things that we may have wished we could do, but protocol and custom and tradition hems us in and we don't do it. Africa, you've got freedom to do what the hell you like. So this chap built this uh, establishment. You can stay here, it's in Nairobi. And he built a two-story establishment to protect the Rothschild giraffe, which were endangered at that time. And built in such a way that they join you for breakfast. Tents have progressed, and we'll whiz through these. They can be quite lavish affairs now. This is not the same tent that I went on with my grandfather or my father uh, on safari. Very lavish affairs. Bathrooms, a lot of people don't realize, this is a tent. Two hand basins, running water, baths, flushing toilets, this is a tent. Toilets. Bars, always with a view. Africa, we always have to look out. Light is very important to us in Africa. And then the people. And a lot of people, how many people are frightened of going to Africa? Well, good for you. But I just talked to somebody about her visit to Africa and taking a little while with you. A little while to connect with the local people. They are different. For a start, they're black. 
And we don't say that word, do we? But they say it. I'm black. They're proud of it. They're very dignified, and they don't have any self-consciousness about themselves at all. Great self-esteem. And they love it when you come on safari. Big smiles all the time. And this is a big tradition on safari. What do you think this is? This is the morning tea ritual. Very important. And a very polite knock-knock. And the tea is pushed through this little hatch. You then open the hatch your side while he discreetly closes the hatch his side. And so this is what you're doing. You're on, we're talking about photographic safari. You see the modern vehicle? Anybody worried about the fact that it's open? Why do you think that is? Why would the lions not go for that chap sitting in the jeep? Notice the lions are not even looking at him. <laughs> Why? What's that? They're poor people. Not going to taste very nice. Oh. No, what it is, what it is, is actually the lion doesn't see that as food. He sees it as an object, a huffing, puffing object that he's seen before and doesn't pose a threat, doesn't shoot at him. However, we are at the top of the food chain. And believe it or not, if you go to Africa, just remember this, if you're ever in a situation where you feel concerned about your safety because there's lions over there, we're at the top of the food chain. Lions are frightened of you. All wildlife is frightened of us. We stand upright. We look tall. And over the years, most of wildlife knows that's a dangerous thing. So it takes a while to tame any wild animal. They don't want to be anywhere near us. So remember that if you ever feel fear. So in an open Jeep, no problem. Stand up in the Jeep, different situation. <laughs> Listen to your guide. So this is what we're doing. What about this fellow sitting on the front here? He's the tracker. And what do you think this thing is down here? Is it a leopard or a cheetah? What's the difference? This is your <laughs> trivia questions for the morning. Well, one essential difference, difference between a cheetah and a leopard. Who has the spots? Cheetah. Well done. Well done. Who's the, who said that? Yeah, well done. So that's the way to tell it. One is heavier than the other, uh, etc. As you say, many, many differences. But essentially, the spots are on the cheetah. What does the leopard have if he doesn't have spots? He has rosettes. 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 If you know what a rosette is, it's that funny thing. Yeah. Funny thing. Anyway, what about the tracker on the front? Is he in danger? Is he going to get eaten? He's a bit, he's a bit on edge, this fellow. Because when we go into the um, bush, we have a tracker on the front because he's out looking unobstructed to find game. But whenever we see predators, we pull him into the jeep. Because he can look more like a man sitting there all by himself. So, uh, you're right, you're right, yeah. So they're, they're stupid or brave, one or the other. Um, okay, so just more of, you see that there's a closed-in jeep. You can do it closed-in in East Africa. You're quite right, John. And he has a wonderful um, quotation that I don't expect you to read from there. But this is one of your American authors. I don't know if any of you know this lady, Jody. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Picold. So you probably know it. She's written many books, won several several awards, and if I stand back here, I'll read it for you. Uh, but she captures very much the uh, uh, spirit of Africa. Um, Africa, you can see a sunset and believe you have witnessed the hand of God. You watch the slow lope of a leopard and forget to breathe. You marvel at the tripod of a giraffe bent to water. In Africa, there are ir iridescent blues and the wings of birds that you do not see anywhere else in nature. In Africa, in the midday heat, you can see blisters in the atmosphere. When you are in Africa, you feel primordial, rocked in the cradle of the world. It's a wonderful quote. And she captures absolutely what it is about. You're going home. And so, believe it or not, how many of you cry quite openly when you feel emotional? Well, when, it, when you get to Africa, you'll cry a lot. <laughs> you'll cry a lot. And we get people who come to us and 
find themselves in the middle of the Serengeti. In situations like this, where you can't see another vehicle, you can't see another house, and something comes over you, and you feel that you are home. And we have a wonderful saying in Zambia, it's called your mtima. Mtima wanga nabwera. It's your spirit. And you just feel a total connection that you've come home. And people are reduced to tears, they're overwhelmed, and they're embarrassed. And I say to them, cry, because we all do, you're home. That's a wonderful tradition in Africa. It bring, it, the Africa in Africa, the day is bookended. We get up in the morning with a cup of tea, and we are out with early, early with the animals. And in the evening, we have to have sundana. We have to close the day. We have to honor the day. Uh, dining in Africa is a very romantic affair. And this is another uh, quote from another gentleman uh, who actually has a big association with Zimbabwe. Uh, this fellow is Brian Jackman. And he writes for the Daily Telegraph and has spent an awful lot of time going back to Africa and writing about it. And he captures very much what Africa is about. So I'll read it to you. Africa changes you forever, like nowhere on earth. Once you've been there, you will never be the same. But how do you begin to describe its magic to someone who has never felt it? How can you explain the fascination of this vast, dusty continent, whose oldest roads are elephant paths? Could it be because Africa is the place of all our beginnings, the cradle of mankind, where our species first stood upright on the savannas of long ago? It's beautifully said. And this little chap, here, yeah, he's taking a bath, and he's an orphan. And elephant families, I told you, are modeled very much on our family structures. They stay together. Babies stay with their mothers. They grow up. They interact with their aunties and uncles. But when poaching comes along and their mothers are shot, they then, just like our children, they can be fed, but they soon die if they don't get the friendship and the warmth and the feeling of belonging to a group. So that's what's happening here. See the bottle of milk? And so this will be the little chap's keeper and they will bond. And he'll cry if they get out of, um, if he gets out of their uh, uh, view. Anybody know what this is? Ants? It's the, it's the great migration, which, um, takes place in Serengeti. Um, millions and millions of wildebeest and zebras. And this is, if we just go back a second, uh, that is what's called a river crossing because this is a show on the move. This is one of the world's greatest shows. It takes place 365 days of the year. It goes round and round the Serengeti, following the rains and the grass. They're looking for food for their new offspring. And following the train of wildebeest and zebras are all the predators. And when they come to a river crossing, it's about all the crocodiles. They've got to run the gauntlet and get across there without being eaten by a crocodile. So it's a major moving spectacle. And one of the things you can do, which I do with clients, is you park up your Jeep right there, take out the table, the tea table, set out your tea, and wait for the moving herd of millions of wildebeest and zebras to just come towards you, split and just engulf you. And then you just sit quietly and peacefully in the middle of this herd. You can reach out and touch a wildebeest. Because if you sit quietly, animals are not frightened of you. There's only one problem. You have to get back to camp. And you're now surrounded by millions of wildebeest. And hope to heck they don't dwell too long. So this is it. This is the Ngorongora crater. Africa is full of world geographical phenomena that you will not find anywhere else. One of the geographical features that was visible from space when the astronauts went up was the Rift Valley. It's a big gash in the earth, stretches all the way from the Suez Canal. A lot of people don't realize it runs through East Africa, but it goes all the way down to Mozambique and includes many of the rivers and the lakes 
en route. But this is the world's largest caldera. Anybody know what a caldera is? Volcano. Collapsed volcano. So it's, it's extinct, but it's a collapsed volcano. It's the world's largest uh, volcano. It's full of, I told you, some of the world's most exotic wildlife. Gorillas. They're only now about 800, but that's a happy story. They got down to about 450. So they're now about 800. Mountain gorillas. And this is how close you get. This is actually Sonia. That's with not the, me, but I took the picture. You took the picture. <laughs> oh, that's showing how close. That's the silverback in charge of his family. Chim chimpanzees. This looks as though these are tame and they're being taken out for a walk. Uh, it's not that at all. They're running along the path and you're following. And again, just remember this. We used to live with these animals. And so they're used to you if you're not harming them and you're not a threat. And so you can get this close. And then not to forget the oceans. These are humpback whales off the coast of South Africa that come through every season. And yes, even penguins. Anybody know what they're called? They're called jackass penguins because they make that same noise like a donkey. And then don't forget, I mentioned the Indian Ocean Islands. So this is off the, Mo the coast of Mozambique. All of this embraces safari. Africa is the most exotic place. You can do all of these different things. This is Nyemba Island, just north of Zanzibar. Barefoot Island. That's it. Tucked in there is the camp you just saw. This is what you can do in the evenings on the beach. And you are a pinprick on the world. But they're all lavish affairs. And then let's not forget the people. And so we have this report, we have this feedback time and time again from people who travel with us to Africa. I went for the wildlife, I came back in love with the people. Because they're so gracious and we tend to want to give them things because we see them there, that no, they don't have any shoes. Let's give them shoes. Uh, what about hats? They need hats. It takes us a while to realize. They're very happy as they are, thank you very much. <laughs> and the interaction, they're as fascinated with us as we are with them. And so you can see here the interaction, lots of giggling, lots of laughing. Here the Maasai lady is trying on the other lady's hat and realizing it doesn't really fit very well and no, I don't need a hat. <laughs> um, the youngsters particularly, children, uh, Africans love children. Children get very early responsibility in Africa. You're taken out with the goat herd as a very small child. And so they have a special place in society. Again, this, the Maasai has this jumping ceremony, so how high can you jump? And then this is a lady from, anybody recognize this one, John? Where's she from? Somewhere in Africa. Oh, who said it? Himba. Well done. So this lady's from Namibia. Even in the remotest parts of Africa, there are people living. These are our oldest ancestors still around. This is a Himba lady, and look, she's fascinated with this lady. We have a lady who works in an office in uh, Windhoek in Namibia. She loves to color her hair. She's a young lady. So one day it's pink, the next day it's green, blue, her hair. And when she visits the Himba, they are fascinated. Mm. Green hair. Who ever saw such a thing? <laughs> This is Father Henry. Wonderful work being done in Africa, and I'm sure some of you probably got involved. The best gift you can give somebody in Africa, what do you think it is? Shoes? Education. Hats? Education. 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 So there are certain safari operators, and we in the industry feel so pleased with the work that we're doing uh, that all, most of the places that we send people are to the remote areas of Africa. There would be no school, there would be no clinic if it wasn't for the lodge. Because they're using your proceeds when you visit to set up the clinic and the lodge for the local people. So it's very, very important going out on these safaris. And people like Father Henry, because of the scourge of HIV and AIDS, Africa has many, many more than its share of orphans. With no guidance, nowhere to go. And so... It doesn't cost much to educate a child in Africa. And so Father Henry actually raises most of his money here in Newport Beach. And we have a lady who works with us, Ros Berry, who supports his foundation, the African Child Foundation. Uh, he, she supports it. 
So here are pictures of the Himba, um, interacting with them. And desert to some of the world's best vineyards. Winelands. Winelands in Cape Town. So eclectic. Don't think of Africa as just savanna and dust and bush. Vineyards, and this is the New World's oldest vineyards in Cape Town. Uh, how do you think, quick short story, how do you think wine vineyards got to South Africa, got to Africa in the first place? Well, all of them. But what happened? It was the British. So what happened? No, the British don't grow wine. When they were sailing, they had to go around the Cape of Good Hope and with their sailing ships and go all the way to the New World to get spices. There was no refrigeration. Everything stank. So spices were worth a lot of money, more than gold and diamonds. And it was a race to get there and bring back the, diamond, the, the spices and sell them in Europe. And you had to pass through Cape of Good Hope and get resupplied. And every time a ship came by, they noticed a difference. On the British ship, half the sailors were dead from scurvy. On the French ship, they were all alive and well, <laughs> singing the Marseillaise. <laughs> Why? Um, Portuguese? Vitamin C, where did it come from? The from the wine. So on a, on a French ship, you get a glass of wine every day. On a British ship, if you're lucky, you get a little glass of, of port, which is not quite the same. And so, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, that's the Portuguese. You get a glass of rum on the, on the British ship. Uh, and so they then figured it out, we better grow some grapes here. Other great geographical phenomena, this is... Africa's tallest mountain, 19,300 feet, and you can walk up it. Africa's very accommodating. <laughs> so when you stand at the top of that, you literally can raise your finger and touch God. You're that close. And you can see all of Africa. This is the Okavanga Delta, another geographical phenomenon, the world's largest inland delta. Most rivers flow to the sea. This one flows inland and turns a desert into an oasis. Back to the desert. This is what it would be without the Okavanga Delta. And surprise, surprise, animals thrive in it. People thrive in it. These are our oldest ancestors again, the Himba. You can play in it if you're a youngster. These Himba do actually live there. You can visit with them. This, if you're brave enough, is sliding down a sand dune. And this is in the Namib Desert, which is the world's oldest desert with the highest sand dunes. And you can come down here at a great rate of knots. The world's oldest living plant. Anybody know what it's called? So, well, yes. Somebody's very informed back there. Uh, thrives in the desert, believe it or not. With these oryx. And we'll flip through these. And lo and behold, elephants in the middle of the desert. One of the most amazing sights in Namibia is to come over a sand dune. There's nothing there. And you see this. Where are they going? Where have they come from? Where do they get their water? And you marvel. We think it's all about us. And the quiet. We are, and the quiet, the stillness. You can hear the sand sing. They talk about singing sand. And it's quiet. Absolutely. This is a skeleton coast. Source of, scene of many wrecks, shipwrecks. And then up north, somebody went to Ethiopia. You were saying again, you went to Ethiopia. So remember where this is? Lalibela. Where they carved these churches out of the rock. This is some of the oldest religions in the world started here. Again, I'm just trying to demonstrate to you, we think of Africa in one dimension. It's wildlife, primitive people, bush. You come across this and you marvel. How the heck did these people dig this thing out of the rock? And it's used. This is not for tourists. Here's a service going on. Uh, same, same thing. Now to the romance. This is called a star bed. You sleep out at night, ballooning in the morning. By the way, every balloon ride is a crash landing. <laughs> But in Africa, you can be happy because you can look forward to a nice bush breakfast. Another star bed. It's got a nesting thing on the top, which is actually a, a, a patio. And there you can just see through. And that's what you're looking at. So I was fortunate in when I first got into this travel industry, I used to run trips overland 
And we used to go from London across the Sahara Desert all the way down to Cape Town, driving. And in the Sahara Desert, we would drive. There's no road. And at night, we'd just stop. We didn't pitch tents. We just put out bed rolls. And you'd lie on your bed, and you'd look up at this. And occasionally, you'd see the contrails of a jet going over. That was your only connection to the rest of the world. And a Coke bottle being thrown out. But the, you, felt, you felt totally insignificant. And realized that the world is not all about you. There's so much more. Another major geographical feature, one of the seven wonders of the world, the Victoria Falls. Anyone know why it's up there? Is it the, is it the biggest? Is it the widest? The tallest? Iguazu is the widest. Angel Falls in Venezuela is the tallest. This has the most <coughs> volume of water going over it. And in the local language, it's called Mosiotunya, the smoke that thunders. When you're there at the height of the falls, you cannot hear yourself talk. You cannot hear yourself think. And if you're brave enough, at low water, you can go here. Devil's Pool, it's called, and that's the precipice right there. Anybody done it? But it's a romantic place to be. I don't know if he's about to throw her off the cliff or not. But, um, and throughout Africa, it's a wonderful place to re, uh, reaffirm your vows, your marriage vows. I don't know if you can see, but over there is a leopard serenading him in the tree. And again, here we are, um, these wonderful sunsets where you just see forever. Here's that map I showed you of the migratory routes out of Africa. And so we did. We all originated here, found our way into Europe, found our way into Asia and beyond. And if you ever get time to uh, study that, it's quite a, hu a, quite a humiliating, uh, humbling rather, experience. Sand people we've looked at, very short people, here they are. And you can still visit these people. These are our oldest living ancestors. And they're in Namibia. And here is how we always end the day. So this is looking out over the Masai Mara, the northern part of the Serengeti. And there's a wonderful lodge just being built there that Sonia was just at. And this is how you finish the day. So thank you. We romped through it. Um, we've got about zero minutes for questions. <laughs> But if anybody has a question, I'd be happy to answer it. Any questions? Oh. One over there, Audrey. Um, it's really the politics of Zimbabwe um, with um, the president now to, out of office. Do you have an update on whether there will be a change in how the country is led? No, so what's happened in Zimbabwe is, a, is simply a change of leadership, but the regime is still in place. But it's all politics. It's the same as in this country. It's politicians arguing about power and wealth, etc., leaving everybody else to get on with their lives. And so throughout all that tumultuous change at the Victoria Falls, which is a big, obviously, focus and destination for tourists, no disruptions, flights went in and out, everybody got on with their lives. But nothing better for the people. Well, the people, I think, um, as I say, as long as the regime, which Mugabe used to do, but as he got more senile, he stopped doing it, as long as they don't practice violence on the people and beat them up, making them vote one way or the other, uh, they're able to get on with their lives. Yeah. You're carrying two different sticks, and I would like to know what they are. Ah, i just be reminded, I have to repeat the question. Why am I carrying these things? So... This, anybody know what this is? Everybody in Africa carries one of these. Yeah, because you get the flies. And so in Africa, you'll see people, you'll be talking to someone, you'll be nonchalantly doing this, and the other one's doing this, and they don't miss a beat, and occasionally they'll flick each other uh, <laughs> to get a fly that the other one hasn't seen. What's that made so, of? so this is normally, a, it's a tail, obviously, and it's usually the tail of a cow. <laughs> The tail of a cow, but in the early days it would be a zebra, something with a very bushy tail, obviously. Would be, and it's mounted then on a, on, a, on a wooden handle. And this is a very important, uh, th this, this is actually uh, a sign of office, yes. This is, a, this is actually a sign of office. So if you have this, you are an elder. 
And so you carry it with you wherever you go. The young Morans, they carry the spear. That's their sign of who they are. But the elders carry this, which again is a form of respect, uh, and uh, that this gentleman is one of the elders. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, Lynette's wrapping us up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No. So in Africa now, it's very civilized. Uh, oh, the question. Well, you did. But after listening to you and seeing this, I'm a little more interested in possibly going. But do I still need to get the shots? So it's not shots. It's not shots. So shots is all about. And by the way, you all have a great influence on Africa. So high season. A lot of people ask me, and coming back to your question, but a lot of people ask me, when's the best time to go to Africa? Africa is ready for you whenever you want to go. You make it the high season, because why? You all going to go in the summer with the school holidays. So supply and demand, you push up the prices, that's regarded as high season. But only for prices, it's not dependent on what's going on in Africa. You saw how eclectic it is, how different it is, the different geography, the different climates, etc. Equator, two rainy seasons. Down in South Africa, one rainy season. It's a huge continent. Anybody know how many countries make up the continent of Africa? 54. It was 53 until Sudan divided itself into two. Now it's 50. Thank you so much. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and the shots, well, the reason I say about the, the shots is that you don't need any shots. It's dictated by your doctors. So your doctors want to load you up with typhoid, cholera, every other blooming thing. That's your choice. You're not going to find them there. That's your choice. The one thing you should take, depending where you're going, there are places that you don't get it, the one thing you should take is anti-malaria. And that's a pill. It's not a shot. It's a pill. You take a pill. It's very easy. You take it every day. It has very few side effects. And you don't need it every place you go in Africa, just certain places. That's all. You don't need all these other things. It's you and your doctors and them prescribing over-the-top stuff. In Africa, we take nothing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.